Good morning. I hope I can convey this r- the right way, the way the Lord's been conveying it to me. Um. So my scripture is, I'm going to be back and forth between 1 Thessalonians and Ephesians. I'm in 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, the key, the heart of uh, what I'm talking about is do not quench the Holy Spirit and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. But what really hit me this morning is verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It's short. It says, pray without ceasing. But I like to back it up even before that, rejoice always. And it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from every form of evil. And with the pray without ceasing, what the Lord's been showing me is he also hit me with that verse, tied it to Isaiah 9, where it talks about Isaiah's describing Jesus, and he says that the government will be on his shoulders. Well, if the government is on Jesus' shoulders, Jesus being the head, that means that the shoulders, which is the body, means that the government will rest upon the body of the church. Amen. Can I get an amen, or am I losing people here? See, what has happened is we've grown complacent, and we don't vote, and we don't press in, and we don't lift up those that are supporting biblical things in our government. And so then we find ourselves to where I don't know what next week week may bring. And I'm not trying to scare anybody because fear is of the devil, but we need to be awake, church. But if we do not quench the spirit, we won't get into those positions, will we? Because the Spirit brings truth and it brings life. So from there, I'm going to go over to Ephesians 4. We're going to start. Well, I'm going to start at verse 29, but I, I want to yet understand, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption is the heart of it, which is in 30, which is wonderful because it, it tells you what grieves the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as in good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It goes on to say, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. What's the solution to make sure that you don't grieve the Holy Spirit? Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave. You And Jesus actually said, if you don't forgive them, your sins are not forgiven. Man, we got to get this, folks, that we can't hold stuff against people, anybody, anybody at all, because it's a road to death and destruction. And going right along with this, with the Holy Spirit, is we need to test the spirits. When somebody, when the Lord speaks to me and gives me a word, I test it before I release it. Because if I don't test it before I release it and it doesn't line up with the word, guess what? It's not of the Spirit of God. And that means that I'm deceived and I'm listening to familiar spirits that sound like God that I've known from my past, usually. But they're really good at sounding just like God. But we need to back it up to the pray without ceasing. Guess what? Paul was on to something here. If I'm in prayer continually, that means I'm in co-union, communion with the Father, so I'm not going to grieve the Spirit. I'm not going to quench the Spirit because I'm seeking Him and asking Him in everything that I do, no matter how small or how large it is, I'm going to seek Him. Also with the pray without ceasing, all the things that the disciples seen, they cast out devils, they healed the sick. They never asked Jesus how to do that. They asked him one question, how do we pray? Teach me how to pray, Lord. 
because they knew, or I hope that they figured it out, that, hey, there's something with Jesus getting up before the Son every day and going away to be with the Father. And then guess what? He comes down off the mountain, and demons have to flee. Sickness has to go. Pray without ceasing. I can't specify that enough, church, in this and pray without ceasing. When Jesus cleared the temple, it was because he said it became a den of thieves, that it needs to be a house of prayer. First and foremost, we need to be a house of prayer. If I am not praying, how can I help you? I can't, because I'm going to give you what seems right. It's pretty cut and dry. We need to pray, folks. And, and, I could go on and on, but we need to look at our Father who art in heaven. That's not the prayer. That is the model of prayer. There's a model to that. If you break it down and look at it, you go to him first in worship, honoring him, wanting to do his will. You're down at the end of the prayer chain on that. Because guess what? We're to deny ourselves and pick up our cross without ceasing church and we'd have a lot less bicker and a lot less fighting and we would destroy hell every day every day i love you guys and i hope y'all receive that with love It's been having uh, its own little moods lately, so I don't know what's going on with it, but there he goes. All right, so we know today is joy, right? That's what we're focusing on is joy. And we've started every sermon the last three weeks now in Luke chapter 2, but I, I'm going to try to bring us to a place today. There's two things I want to address, and number one is I want to make sure that we start at the beginning and not in the middle. And that we finish at the end and not in the middle. Okay? Because Christianity starts in the middle and ends in the middle way too often. That's part of what, what Kevin was just talking about. So we're going to try to get there, but we're going to look at it through the lens of joy. Because if we start at the beginning and get to the end, it will produce joy. Okay? And those that live in that place are overwhelmed with joy and it never stops. Okay? So Luke chapter 2 verse... 10, the angel, we know this, right? The shepherds are in the field. The angel appears in the night and tells them, you know, they freak out. They get scared. That's verse 9, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for I bring good news of great joy that will be for all the people. How many people? Oh, so who was intended to receive this message of joy? Every single person, doesn't matter what religion, it doesn't matter what nation they grew up in, it doesn't matter what skin color, it, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is that God has a message meant for every human on the planet, and when they hear that message, it will produce what? Great joy, right? So that is what heaven's expectation was. The problem is, if we start in the middle, our joy is not overwhelming. It's a little bit. And if we end in the middle, our joy is not complete either. Amazing thing is Paul wrote often, and he would say things about, you know, I write this so that your joy might, might be complete. And Jesus even said that, right? Like, I say these things to you to make your joy complete. Yes. I know. I'm, I'm being, what's the word? I'm being vague on purpose. We will get there. Okay, I'm just making a point for now. We'll see what I'm talking about in a second. All right, but the angels here know that Jesus, right, a child is born, right? Look at what it says next. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, meaning the Messiah. He is Messiah, as you see in that translation. Awesome. So I want you to understand that the angels could see something that you and I may not be able to see. 
Let me give you an example, and I got this from Carrie Wood's book, The Sonship Book. Um, not the Abba Foundations, but the Sonship Book. One of the chapters talks about how uh, he was in Bogota, Colombia, and if y'all remember, he talked about how like every time he's there, he gets like downloads, right? He gets revelation every time he's there. But anyway, so he was there, and that's where his wife is from, and uh, and so he saw in the distance two mountains covered in the snow, covered with snow in July when he was there in July, and he thought, never seen that before. Now I know, like my dad, he's been to Colorado in June or July, and 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 it's covered in snow. The mountain that he was in, that he was there, you know, visiting, whatever. So, um. So that's that's a normal thing for mountains of certain altitude they, to be covered in snow. But what he said was, it's very odd that he could see and never seen those mountains before. And he's like, well, I'm not from here, so maybe I just never really looked at it. Super clear day, no clouds in the sky, maybe. So he looked at it for a while, and then he went and told his wife. And his wife said, no, no, you can't see the mountains from here. And he said, well, come look. So she went out on the balcony and looked, and she was like, oh, my gosh. So then they did the GPS thing, and they found out that those mountains – are over 150 miles away. But because the sky was so clear that day, you could see the mountains. Now, we have seen that kind of experience, maybe not so much that particular one, but we have had this kind of encounter where on a really clear day, you can see further than you can on a normal day. Or like when there's a fog, you just can't see very far. Okay, so my whole thing is, what I'm trying to say with this is, these angels could see further than most people can. And so what, what Paul calls it is it's a veil that people can't see very far past it, and it clouds our vision, and we get caught up on things, and what you believe will remove a veil. That's what, that's what he says um, <coughs> in Second, Second Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. But anyway, so, so the angels had a bigger vision. They could see further, and why? Because they are, they are from the starting line. Okay, so what I'm talking about, my biggest thing right now is talking about a sinner saved by grace. You are a sinner saved by grace. Doesn't that sound like the starting line? It is not. It is the middle. Let's, let's go back. For before the foundations of the world, you were in the Father's heart. You were on his mind. He planned out all your days before the foundation of the world, correct? Okay, so we know that one. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, or Ephesians chapter 1, and verses 4 and 5, Callie. This is the starting line. Unfortunately, we get caught up in the sinner, which is step 2. And we start at point number 2 instead of point number 1. And I want to show us today something that I saw in scriptures today, actually last night, when the Lord was like, I start at the starting line. That's how my conversation with him started last night. About 10 o'clock, Kate will tell you, we were watching something, and all of a sudden I'm on my phone, and I have my Bible on my lap, trying to have a conversation with her, doing other things, but I'm getting a download, correct? And she was kind of like, I guess I'm going to go to bed then, because you're not listening to me. No, she really wasn't that bad. But she was like, what time is it? I was like, it's 1030, you know. Anyway, so, um, and then I was up early this morning because God woke me up really early and said, let's go back and finish this conversation. There's a finish line too. And I was like, oh, okay. So, so let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, for he, who's he? Capital H. That's, that's, a, that's a hint, right? For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So before the world was even created, before he spoke, he had already chosen you to be in him. Verse 5, not just holy and blameless, yes, to be holy and blameless, but more than that, he predestined you to be adopted through Jesus himself. Look at verse 6. To the praise of his glory. Okay? And so my, my Bible says not just adopted, but adopted as sons. So verse 5 says, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. Now, I want us to understand the finish line is grace. Okay? Grace does something. But if we don't finish the fullness of grace, 
then we don't cross the finish line either. Which is why I said don't stop in the middle with, okay, what is grace? You tell me, what is grace? Okay. There you go. That's the finish line. See, often we think grace is covering a multitude of sins. And that's not the finish line. The finish line is a transformation that comes from the forgiveness of sins. Right? So let's keep going because y'all, y'all nailed that. That's great. I love it. All right. So he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. It also says in Revelation 13 verse 8 that Jesus was slain before the foundations of the world. So you were chosen, predestined. Romans clarifies predestined and says that predestined is the ability to look like Jesus, right? So you were predestined before the foundation of the world to look just like Jesus. And he was predestined to be slain so that your predestined ability could come to pass. And grace would have to be the necessary means to change you. So why is this so important? Because if I'm focused on the, I start in the middle and I end in the middle, where it's all about sin. I'm a sinner saved by grace, in line, his grace sa- set my, my sin free, and there I can walk. The problem is it's all in the middle, not very deep. So my relationship with God is grateful, but my fruit is based off of how well I do. Am I abusing his grace? I'm still a sinner. I'm trying to overcome my my worthlessness. I'm trying to get rid of the depravity. But it's taking for granted something that Jesus did. See, Jesus, Jesus tells us that we started in heaven pure. A son or daughter of the Most High God. And then the cross came and grace was released. And that grace made us sons and daughters of the Most High. So we realize that sin was the thing that took away our sonship, but that grace brought us back to sonship. We okay? All right, trying to make this super simple and clear, right? I'm going to try to process what I've said and make sure I don't skip anything. Let's go to John 13, verse 3. This is awesome. John 13, verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything to him. Actually, what it says is it given him all power and authority into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So was he a, obviously he wasn't, but as a man, was he a sinner saved by grace and grace set him free or was he a son going back to a father? So he started at a starting line and he ended at the finish line And not somewhere in between having a late start and an early finish. Saying, well, I won my race. But understanding that the race was always about being a son. So my thing is this. We get so hung up on sin. That we don't understand how to get free from it. What gets us free is knowing who the father is and what he's created you to be. That is the stronghold that you stand on that the devil can't demolish. And it's also the weapon that destroys every stronghold that the the devil has built up in your life. Jeff, you're addicted to this. Jeff, you have this problem. Jeff, you you can't stop doing this. No, I'm a son. Those things are dead. Now, I have a question for you. Because I told you we were short sermon today. I told you that we were going to talk about joy, right? So Jesus, this is good, John 17, verse 24. This one just entered my head. Yeah, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me, John 17, 24, sorry, Kelly. Father, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am, Then they will see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. What is the beginning and the finish line? God loves you. Sin has no place in that race. 
the acknowledgement of sin has no place in that race. The only thing you can acknowledge is the Father's love. If you acknowledge anything else, if you hear, yes, but, Jeff, you are not on the race that God has set. You are not following the lead of the Holy Spirit. You are not in step with him. This is not a complicated message. When we struggle, I'm trying to figure out how to say this properly, so Lord, you've got to speak now. When we struggle with our identity, with our weaknesses, with all those things, and I, I just can't break them. I need a savior. I need a redeemer. Quick, what does Redeemer mean? To buy back. Check this out. To buy back means that ownership was lost. To buy back, not to buy. To buy back. Jesus is your Redeemer. Meaning you were His you gave yourself away, he bought you back. Starts at the fin at the beginning, start at the first, right? Start at the starting line. He loves you. Sin came in, he redeemed you. Why focus on this thing? The angels got it. They said, a savior is born this day. He knows who his father is. He knows where to start. He's going to live it, and everyone who hears it will join in, and it will produce great joy. Not real, it's, it's beyond the, well, I'm a detestable human, totally depraved, and struggling. But God is patient with me. Great job trying to run a race you were not meant to run. What's the race? Before I ever sinned, I was a son of God, but I didn't know it, but he did. And so from that moment on, he has been in pursuit of me saying, I want a relationship with you. You were created to have a relationship with me, and I don't care about all that stuff in the middle. Let's just get you over here to the finish line, remembering what the starting line was. I love you. Super simple. So. Right before, I don't know if y'all saw this, but Kate was doing announcements, and I got up and I ran over and I grabbed a hymnal. And I brought it over here because this song is awesome. Open your hymnals to page 544. Come on. 544. Oh, man. Redeemed how I love, I can't sing it. It's fast. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Redeemed though his infinite mercy, his child, forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child, and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Look at verse 3. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. What's the law that he gave us? Don't go backwards into sin. The law is love God, love others. Was that not powerful? Fanny Crosby wrote that song. Wow. Long time ago, but the song is right on the money. See, if we can just focus on the fact that you were not a slave bought and set free. You were a son, sold yourself into slavery, and have been set free again. You were a son or daughter. You always were. That's all you ever were. From God's perspective, he never saw sinner. He never had, no, he was like, no, you're my son. 
Because even when, even when somebody gets sold into slavery, their father is still alive, would still see them as a son, not as a slave. And would do everything they can to pay them, to show them who they really are. You don't belong to that person. You don't belong in those chains. There is no greater sense of joy than starting at the starting line knowing I would before heaven physically was made, right? Like before God even spoke and said, let there be the heavens. You were already a son or a daughter of God, already established there. And we just read it. You were already established. It was Ephesians chapter one. You were already established as a as a as a inheritor, an heir. That's the word I was looking for as an heir of the throne. Don't get caught up on the other stuff, the lie of the enemy trying to put you in chains. You're free. Live free. Not because and don't live as like I was in slavery and now I'm free. No. I've always been a son. And the bondage, the period of chains that I was in never really applied. Before the son prodigaled his way away from his father. Y'all know the word prodigal means to be wasteful, right? Doesn't mean to stray. It means to be wasteful. Before he prodigaled his way, he wasted away his inheritance, left his father. What was he? He was a son. Because of that, what did the father do? He waited for son to come home. Why? Because he was never in father's eyes. He was never in the wrong. Just come home. You. Huh. We get so caught up on that, that whole thing. Like I was a sinner and I needed Jesus. And, and it's right. You're right. But from God's perspective, see, that's what I'm trying to get us to is to understand God's perspective on all of this. The father didn't care. All he knew was his son was not in his company. That was the only thing he knew. He was he was lost and now he's home. Not he wasted everything. He made dumb decisions. He was prodigal. He, none of that. It was he wasn't here and now he's here. So what is God's perspective for you? You were a son and now you're a son. You were a daughter and you're, now you're now you know you are. That's all there is to it. Not you strayed, not you lost it, and now you're back. Not I paid the price so you can come home free. But you're home, where I always wanted you. Blessed him with more than than he thought he. Would, I mean, right? He's like, I'll come and be a servant, and his dad's like interrupting him. Stop the speech. Stop practicing the speech. Yeah, kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party. Throw the feast. How, how beautiful is this? Father, we thank you for redeeming us, for making it so clear to us that we are redeemed. Father, I thank you that you start where you are and not where we think our life started. That's not my beginning. My beginning was already in heaven. Already in, like the scripture says, in my father's bosom, I was already there and I've always been there. Thank you for showing us that today. God, I pray that that would be a truth that we would settle on. That's why, Father, it's so important that we remember passages like Ephesians 4 that Kevin brought up where it says to get rid of the wrath. Get rid of it. You're so good, Lord. We thank you. Father, I pray that right now as we sing to you, God, my prayer is that we would, we would fill this room with joy and we would bless you, Lord. We'd bless you as a response and gratitude for being redeemed. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to stand and we're going to worship and uh, just finish with this. And so if you can come on, or, you know, come up if you want to. You can stay there. I don't care how you do it. You're free. But let's just worship God together. Callie, will you mute this mic?
Help me just to live. Sing it with me.